This is actually a good segue to what we are going to cover next. If minimizing MMD is equivalent to uh, trying to make a discriminator make a mistake, so how about putting a discriminator in the first place and forego all of these kernels and writing down this complex looking uh, loss function? And that's exactly the topic of domain adversarial training. And this is for domain adaptation. What is the big picture? of domain adaptation and what is that uh, domain gap that we are talking about? What is the shift in the distribution? This figure is gonna convey it uh, in a good way. You are trying to classify between these red uh, pluses, these green minuses. If you train a classifier on that, and this is your source domain, you are gonna get a decision boundary which is correctly classifying the red ones as red, the green ones as green. But then during testing, there could be domain shift or shift in the distribution. And all you're doing is looking at these uh, black circles or black dots. There is a shift in the distribution compared to the green and the red ones. And then your algorithm, this decision boundary is gonna make mistakes here. These clearly belong to a different class than a point here. So that decision boundary needs to be adjusted. You don't have any labels for these black dots. All you have are the corresponding input images. And using them, you want to adjust this decision boundary. Let's try to do that. This is the concept of domain adaptation. One application was what I mentioned before, that you have simulated data, which is going to end up being different from real data. Another a naturally occurring shift in the distribution happens when your training data and test data have similar distributions, but they are actually different. This happens a lot when you want to take an algorithm to production and test it against the face of uh, real users. You train something on your data collected up until today, and then you take that algorithm, put it on your web page. Perhaps it's a recommender system, and then it's going to start making mistakes. And that's the reason. There is a shift in the distribution. Ever so slightly different, there is a shift in the distribution. There is a difference between training data distribution and test data distribution. Now you want to fix those issues. You have input space. You have a set of labels, perhaps L of them. You have a source domain. You have a target domain. Uh, source and target domains are actually distributions over the cross domain of X and Y. X are the input. You can think of them as images. Think of Y as your labels. And then you're going to sample data from it. These are theoretical stuff. Under the hood, you're sampling data from some underlying distribution. These are going to end up being labeled data. S, T is going to end up being unlabeled data. That's why here you have an X superscript, unlike DS, this one has a X superscript saying that you don't have labels for these guys. And this is marginal distribution. But in simple terms, you have a set of examples that are labeled. You have a set of examples that are unlabeled. And there is a shift in the distribution of these Xs. And then you have a total number of examples. Okay, so far, so in terms of notation. And like before, you want to build a classifier that has a low target risk, and this is basically your error rates, the number of times that your classifier is gonna make a mistake. We saw a theorem in the previous paper. This is an equivalent theorem, which says that if you are looking for effective domain transfer, then you need to be making your predictions based on featureized images or based on features that are not gonna give away information whether that image is coming from source or target. These features should sort of be universal. They shouldn't contain any information that is going to give away the identity of that image being a source or a target. That's the theorem, and we're going to leverage that. And we saw a similar theorem before. The concept is going to end up being DAN, Domain Adversarial Neural Network. You are going to have a feature extractor parameterized by its own parameters, you're going to have a label predictor, and then you're going to have a domain classifier, which is going to classify between target and source. Okay, so far, so good. Visually speaking, 
you have an input image, which could be an image from your target domain or the source domain. You featureize it using Neural Network GF. You take the features, give it to a domain classifier, which is going to say this image is coming from the target domain. This image is coming from the source domain. And you can write down the loss function on that. At the same time, you're doing classification. Whenever you have labels, you can actually train that. And you usually have labels in your source domain. You don't have any labels in your target domain. For your prediction loss, this looks uh, mathematically complex, but it's actually very simple. You have an image, you featureize it. So now you're stopping up until this point. You take the featureized image, you push it through your classifier. That's going to predict some probability distribution. And then you are going to write down your uh, cross entropy loss. So you know the corresponding labels here from your source domain. Okay, you take X, featureize it, uh, push it through your classifier, compare the predictions of your classifier to the true labels. That's going to give you your loss function. For domain loss, it's the same thing. You take your image, featureize it, push it through your discriminator or your domain classifier. You know the corresponding domain because sometimes you are pushing inside your architecture an image from the source domain, and sometimes it's going to be an image from the target domain. So you know the eyes, it's either a zero or a one, and then you can write down your cross entropy loss. For the domain classification, this is your loss function, which is maximizing the probability of the data coming from the source domain or the target domain. This is maximizing the probability of doing the correct thing. And your labels are a zero and one. It's a one if it's from the target and zero if it's from the source. And this is just a convention. You can replace those and nothing happens. For your prediction loss, this is basically your maximum likelihood, which is equivalent to your cross entropy loss. You take X, featureize it, push it through your classifier network. That's going to output a vector of probabilities. And then you read off the correct uh, entry of that probability and you want to maximize that. Okay, so far so good. And then you're going to write down your objective function, which is trying to classify correctly. And at the same time, uh, you're trying to train your discriminator or your domain classifier. You're trying to train your feature extractor and you're trying to train your classifier. Okay, but what are we doing? When it comes to the domain classifier, we want it to do the correct thing. Given the parameters of your feature extractor, given the parameters of your classifier, so you're basically fixing theta f, you're fixing theta y, and this is not a function of theta d, your domain classifier. So this one is just constant when it comes to optimization. That term doesn't matter. Theta f, you fix it, and then here is the interesting part. What your discriminator or your domain classifier is doing is maximizing this term. There is a minus here. So it's basically minimizing whatever that you have inside the parentheses. And whatever that you have inside the parentheses already has a negative sign in it. And it is basically maximizing the probability of your target and source domain being classified as target and source being correctly classified. So your discriminator or your domain classifier is trying to do the correct thing. It's trying to be as discriminative as possible. Okay. Now the other guy, when you're optimizing over theta f and theta y, this is where the transfer is going to happen. You're going to minimize this objective function. You're fixing your discriminator. So you're fixing theta d's. You're trying to make the correct predictions when it comes to classification. So this guy is trying to classify correctly. But at the same time, these features that are being extracted, you want them to make your discriminator make a mistake. You don't want these features to give away information whether that image is coming from a target or is coming from a source domain. So it's going the opposite route of what you were doing with your discriminator here or your domain classifier. And this is exactly how you're adjusting the decision boundary without having any labels from your target domain by making these features not discriminative when it comes to domain. 
And this way you are extracting features that are generic when it comes to source and target. Was everything clear so far? Okay, perfect. That was our last function. And this is how you're gonna do domain transfer. But there is a catch when it comes to unsupervised learning, unlike supervised learning, writing uh, validation or hyperparameter selection is not that easy. You cannot set aside a portion of your target data to adjust the hyperparameters. Why is that? Because you don't know the corresponding labels to write down your performance metrics. So we need to become a little bit more smart when it comes to hyperparameter selection. And even when it comes to early stopping, let's see how you can solve that problem. You have a source domain that data is labeled. Okay, perfect. We can set aside a portion of it for training. Let's call that S prime. Let's set aside a portion of it for validation. S prime and SV, the union of them is gonna give you your S. Do the same thing with T. T is on labels. It's gonna give you T prime. TV, they don't have any labels. SV and S prime, they have labels. And we are gonna use S prime and T prime to learn a classifier. It's exactly this framework that we went through, but using a portion of the data, perhaps 80% of the data or 90% of the data. We're gonna learn a classifier. Now what you can do is look at T prime. T prime was unlabeled. Now that you have a classifier, we can label them. These are artificial labels or it's a self-labeling process. This is gonna be X, the label coming out of your classifier for all of the images in your training set, T prime. Now this one is labeled. Let's rename this to be our new source. And let's remove the labels on S prime. This is gonna be our new target. This is cool because now you can train another classifier using the same framework. Let's call that eta R because it's the reverse classifier. Now you can go ahead and evaluate eta R on SV. SV was labeled and therefore you can evaluate it. You can evaluate the goodness of eta R. And then you can report the reverse validation risk and use that to select your hyperparameters. And at the same time, you can use SV to do early stopping when you're training eta. And you also need to do early stopping when you're doing eta R. You can use TV because the same way you can actually label them. Once you have your ETA, you can label TV. Not only you can label T prime, you can also label TV. And in terms of applications, you can take a look at the paper and they are reporting some pretty nice results on document, sentiment analysis. These are for text, for image classification, for person re-identification. Person re-identification we cover in part one of the course. This is when you want to actually enter a building or opening your uh, cell phone without uh, entering any security code or uh, swiping any cards. It's gonna identify you because your face is already in their database. Okay, I think it's a good time for me to stop. For those of you who have questions, I'll be around.